In this video, part two, I want to talk about the other half of God, man, which is Eve. And starting with sex, which is what the angels in Enoch, the book of Enoch, and in the Bible, that the one third of the angels, the fallen angels, fell for. They fell mainly because, obviously, the, the devil was proud, but they wanted to have sex with women. And, obviously, the female gods had sex with men. They, That's what they wanted, because angels were created to worship God. Even though they had genitals, they, they weren't sexual beings in that way. And they still aren't the angels that are with God. They are virgins. But these angels, uh, in the book of Enoch, to cut a long story short, were pondering on why in this third heaven, in the earthly realm, Humans are so weak and childish when it comes to sex and things. And so they they were convinced by God through a series of angels, obviously, higher angels, to well, go down to the earth and see what happens to you. And as soon as they got here, because their consciousness is lowered because they're not in the ninth heaven. So in Hinduism and in Buddhism as well, and uh, within right, mostly the Gnostics as well, there are, so especially within the North, there are nine realms. And it's very clear that this is the third, this, this earth, that we're on this universe that we're in it's the third and there are two below and um, when you're in this realm in this and you have this third dimension you are more carnal than you are in the higher realms for some reason and even though they were high realm in high realm beings to begin with, when they lowered themselves, they were just overcome with lust. So to cut a long story short for any women that are watching, Eve is very, very important in Judaism. And she was reincarnated as Bathsheba, David's wife. And she, as the story goes, was bathing, showering, naked on her roof, and David on his temple was so overcome with lust that he, he ordered all his handmaidens and servants to go find her. So that he could have sex with her. And he didn't care that she was married. In fact, he had her husband murdered, basically, so that he could have sex with her. And he was punished for that with a, with a miscarriage of their first child. And this was the greatest sin of David, King David. And he... As you can see, there's still a bit of fallen nature within David, within being, according to Jews, a reincarnation of Adam. Even though he tried to make up for it, there was sin within his own family. His own son um, basically raped his own half-sister. And then... He tried to, 
and then and then there was the, obviously the symbolic nature of one of his of Absalom being caught by his own hair. Apparently, Absalom was so beautiful, he was handsome, and everything, and and he got caught by his own hair in a branch of a tree, and then he was killed by it. And David mourned for him very very much so. Um, And I think most people are aware of how, you know, the Catholic Church is, is over the years has is, is, is said sex is wrong and, you know, and, and all this sort of stuff. And But it isn't, because we have the Nag Hammedi Library and because we have a rediscovery of Gnosticism, and because we have a liberation of the society and we have the internet, and we all have different rules and laws throughout different countries but largely in the west we have a christian mosaic law system we we think of things in terms now in the 21st century as rightly so that the whole narrative of say the nordic pantheon just correlates with how chronos brahma was thinking so you know maybe that's for another video right? but you, you can basically read what Odin or Brahma why he actually created man according to the Gnostics like I say I'm not I'm not a rabbi and I wasn't there but you know um if this is to be believed that it was actually brahma according to the hindus who under the stewardship of vishnu created matter the universe humans and all the diversity of man and the animals it was him according to the Gnostics and the Hindus. And in the Gnostic scriptures, this is why ultimately when we have the word God, it can mean Abba, Elohim, Obviously, the Tetragram Jehovah, um, <clears throat> and we have obviously I am that I am, um, and God identifies Himself clearly as in the Christian uh, religion as as Jesus, right? Jesus is God. So, but we know that no one's actually seen His face, other than truly Jesus, uh, some of the prophets were raptured, but we know that, you know, even the angels, that there's only a small amount of angels, if any, who truly see him. It's, uh, so do we truly know without Jesus coming back? I don't think we do. Uh, unless obviously there's there's 22 kilometers of books that the Vatican have, right? So they have books from even lo from the Great Library of Alexandria. Really. There are books upon books upon books that we don't know about. But the ones that we do, and in, like in the Nordic pantheon, Odin was Cronus, and he he had. He was walking in a garden and he saw the branch of a tree and it looked like a penis to him. So he thought he'd create a man like that. Now, obviously, these angels, they, they can shapeshift and, and they can choose their own sexuality and they can choose what they, they appear to be in this realm. So... But it's true that God created man in his image, which scholars say means that it, 
they were male and female. So women are God. Men are God. Right? And the history of women in the Bible is known to the Jews and it was largely the Christians that zealously persecuted them. Now, obviously there were things that ancient Jews did that modern day Jews don't do. Um, and they sinned a lot. But women was so important to David's story. Um, and Solomon, obviously, very important. Um, and then the Jews had queens, you know, who were Ruth and leaders who were queens and powerful women in the church. Uh, obviously, Jesus appeared to women when he was resurrected. He loved Mary Magdalene. He loved his, and he, you know, and chosen his Emma, his mom, Mary, obviously. And um, there are apocryphal gospels that we don't know are canonical. We we don't say they are. I'm going to say we, I mean scholars, and but there is a gospel of Mary, um, and you can read it. There's a gospel of Joseph, um, Jesus' father. There are these midrashes where Jews have filled in the blanks through prophecy and other means to understand the Bible. And then we have Modernese, Moses, his name was. And one has to just read through his work, which lays out in the masterpiece way just how the Bible is. Um, but of course, the Jews of modern day don't believe in Jesus. And just by using perfect symmetry and the laws of the tenets that I've given you, you can see that Jesus does in fact work into the equation. It makes perfect sense with him being the literal lamb of Passover. And to give a little bit of history, another bit of history on on Bathsheba. In the West, she's depicted with red hair and fair skin, white skin. And you see this in the Little Mermaid, who's called Ariel. Ariel being the another name for Israel. And you see throughout hundreds and hundreds of films a woman with pale skin and red hair, Hollywood films mainly, and it's symbolic of Bathsheba. The reason being is that she was Eve, and that in Judaism she's represented as the sun, and Adam, or then David as well, is represented as the moon. And in Judaism, it was the moon that was created first, right? The, the, it was the night came before the day. Adam came before Eve. Everything is symbolic of this. It, it's so true. And all these ancient goddesses were incredibly powerful. You know, even though they weren't human, um, there were demigods and some of them were demigods uh, some of them were actually human they were personified as goddesses um, so the 
Exo Gaia. Um, if I'm right in thinking she was the mother or consort of Uranus. So she was Cronus's mother, personification of the earth. But she was, according to the myths, a real goddess. And ironically, symbolically, Adam was created from the earth. So his mother was technically the earth, of which, you know, we get the word earth from Gaia. So many of you are aware of the Sumerian tablets, of which in ancient Sumer, they left so many tablets and artifacts behind. And in it is a creation myth where man is created from the earth, a man and a woman. And what they say is, I'm not saying this is scripture, by the way, this, this is just what they say. Although, like I say, it's, it's so incredible how this works into all the major religions, if you read further and deeper, is that man was created, Homo sapiens, from gods, their DNA, angels, and a lower class of man at the time. So Richard Dawkins says that um, we... We didn't just evolve, you know, we didn't just turn from Homo erectus into Homo sapiens, you know, it was a very, very gradual process, you know, um, but there are other classes of humans that have been found, like the Neanderthals, who actually interbred, had sex with Homo sapiens, and they've become us. So to this day, a lot of people who have certain features, like very big, bold men and women, certain jaw lines, they have the DNA tested, they have more Neanderthal DNA than other people. So we are a mix of these two types of humans. And this is the thing, is that we don't have Jesus here right with us now. He will be here soon. And he obviously will explain this to us. And it's largely been just absorbed by the Jews and the Christians as being, well, we don't know. We know we didn't come from apes, you know. This is established fact is that there is no missing link it's been found in the fossil and we know that um you know apes don't have a voice box and they don't have and it was just too little time for man to evolve from an ape into a human and for all the changes to have occurred um so it's interesting to look at the ancient Sumerian tablets, which is where a lot of people lost their faith because they thought, well, you know, these angels are obviously aliens and we're just a slave race. Because it says in the Sumerian tablets that we were created as a slave race and that we were here to mine gold. And that there were two types of these alien or fallen angels that were there and um, there was a rebellion and this is where we get stories of some angels who felt sorry for us and helped us and some that didn't. Now in the book of Enoch, which is not in most people's bibles but this is 
something that is very, very important, and it lines up with the Bible completely. Many people use that as a real book to be trusted, as is very much verbatim. You can believe what's happening in the book of Enoch because it talks about the angels and their whole psychology of why they did it. Um, even if it's not scripture, if it's not true, we have a lot of insight to be learned from it. So, um, going back to Bathsheba, she was depicted with white skin and red hair. Now, the reason being, partly, is because in the Bible, King David is said to be ruddy. And there's even a verse, I'll put it in the link below, inscription, right? There's a verse about King David where a Phoenician mocks him for looking pale. Or is it a Philistine? Yeah, it's someone, a Philistine, it mocks him for being pale. Um, and so the scholars have read deeper into the ethnicity of some of the prophets and we can see clearly through their research, although obviously we don't know for sure, that David, King David, might have actually had some Celtic ancestry and Druid ancestry. Excuse me. Now, it seems preposterous to someone from Israel or um, who's a scholar to kind of like state what an ethnicity, what a person's skin colour would be, because we just don't know, right? We weren't there. There are reliefs and, and paintings of David going back, obviously thousands of years, with him having brown skin. Um, but there it is in the Bible, this, this allusion, a reference to it. And I, 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 I witnessed, watched a video about, Druids, and believe it or not, there are a number of different references to Celtic or Druid type beliefs within David's family. So, in in that religion, within the type of paganism, basically. There was, um, obviously, now I'm not saying David wasn't a Jew, he obviously was a Jew and believed in God and everything, but I'm just saying, like, what, what are these other scholars saying? So, they would behead their enemies. They would parade naked in the street after battle. That's what King David did. They uh, had an incredible love for bards, poets that they called, and they could stop wars, and they were actually lovers and fighters and writers, just like King David. They were musicians, they played musical instruments in battle. Um, and there's just a lot of things that line up within Druid culture that make them incredible fighters. So Celtic women who were in Germany, ancient Germany, Saxony, they, they were so fierce, feared by the Romans because they would boil the Romans to death and eat them. Uh, that's how Celtic women were. 
very, very strong, powerful warriors. And obviously we know about Boudicca being a very powerful warrior queen from Britain. And we know that Ephraim, Great Britain, is linked to King David. We know this. We know this because of the myths of the ten lost tribes coming to the West and specifically David's King David's daughter Tamar, who is known as Tia Taffy, to the Irish. So under when King David died and um, there was a fall of his family dynasty, there was a purge on his family and they had to escape persecution. And the prophet Jeremiah is said to have taken the stone of scone, stone of destiny, destiny which is the stone that Abraham slept on when he saw Jacob's ladder. Um, which is very, very important to what to perfect symmetry and, and, and the whole of the Bible. Because I don't plan these videos, as you can tell. I'm just doing this as a stream of consciousness because it, because I don't like to write things down and do them right. But Jacob's ladder was when he slept on this stone, and then he could see a hierarchy of angels, and it explains how God doesn't actually say, you know, do this, do that kind of thing. There is an order of angels upon angels upon angels upon angels that communicate amongst themselves about the affairs of a plan that archangels are privy to. And even the Archangel Michael is said to be, in some parts of Christianity, and even in some parts of Judaism, as the forerunner to Adam. Now, you see this in Hollywood films, like there's a film with... Um, John Travolta about Michael and he comes to earth and you know and he's he's lazy and he's drunkard and you know he's, he's womanized and everything and it, it it just goes to show that even Michael would who would come to this earthly realm willingly as it seems according to the scriptures of the scriptures he would he would do that willingly to incarnate as a human. I'm not too familiar with all the ins and outs of that. Um, obviously, you know, there's Jehovah Witnesses, which I don't adhere to, that believe that Jesus was Michael. I don't believe that at all. Um, I think it makes sense. There is some sort of connection to Adam and some sort of angel. Um, because it's in Isaiah. So the suffering servant is called all sorts of things in Isaiah. This Messiah. At some point, at one point, he's called the Prince of Peace, and that's a specific reference to Michael. Um, a lot of the time he's called the Prince of Peace. And 
there's just a number of different things. He's called a, and then he's called a servant. Well, lots of people are called servants in the Bible. It's actually a term of affection. Um, not necessarily that he has to do everything that God tells him to do. Because in Ezekiel, the Messiah is said to be hidden in God's quiver, which is an arrow sack. And he's said to be an arrow. The reason being that he is a, what scholars say, is that he is a, a military leader, so he's a weapon of war. But God winnows him down, chips him down, like, because he sins than David does, and he's he's allowed to be rectified by God and man. And this is why we know it's not Jesus. Obviously, Jesus is perfect. He never sinned. And Jesus, yes, many Christians will be watching these videos. Um, there's not a lot of views on the first video, and it's because... A lot of Christians will just watch the first five minutes and think, no, I don't believe in this. Don't believe in paganism. Don't believe in all this reincarnation stuff. Don't, never read the Maldives. Don't understand how the scriptures say he specifically comes from Judah. Jesus comes from Judah. That's very, very clear. It's clear that he's born in Bethlehem. It's clear that he comes riding on a donkey. But what's not clear at all to Christians are the innumerable amount of par parallels between King David and Jesus, with King David being born in Bethlehem itself. And In the Bible, there is, as referenced by the trumpet.com, Gerald Flurry, a reference to the key of David. Now, the key of David, according to him, means that David, or Ben David, when he's reincarnated, he doesn't specifically say that because he doesn't believe in Ben David, he only believes in Jesus. He is, believe it or not, the, the one who decides who goes into the millennial kingdom. He has the keys to the temple, that's what it means. Now the temple was symbolic of heaven and the kingdom of God. So if David has that key, he clearly is a ruler in that kingdom. Obviously, as a Christian, I wouldn't put my hand up and say he has the authority to the final authority. That would be Jesus, you know, God the Father kind of thing. But the Mormons believe, which is another sect of Christianity, that the Ancient of Days spoken of in the book of Enoch and alluded to in Revelation is Adam. So there we have within the book of Enoch and a lot of people, especially from like Sky, Skywatch TV, where I've read a lot of books and got a lot of information from, from Dr. Thomas Horne and Derek Gilbert and Sharon Gilbert especially. Um, and Dr. Thomas Horne's uh, daughter, is that they, he unfortunately, passed away recently, a great man, very sad, um, but they, they don't believe that it makes sense, a lot of it, because you've got this ancient of days, and then you've got being called the chosen one, and it doesn't seem to line up with Jesus at all. Because according to the Mormons, they, they don't believe it is. And um, so there's that. 
And then what started a lot of the journey that I had in understanding Ben David was, say, with the trumpet.com, understanding that obviously, you know, without going into detail, it's, it's been thought, said for thousands of years, you know, it doesn't add up that, that Jesus isn't here and obviously, you know, there's got to be a third temple built and, um, you know, he didn't free the Jews from the Romans. Um, you know, they got persecuted, the temple was destroyed, so they had to rebuild. And the reason being is obviously is that the Christians say that they had to create Ben David and Ben Jovis to make up for the fact that they didn't understand that Jesus just comes back and fulfills all these things. And then they'll cite you the fact that in the New Testament, Jesus is actually asked, are you Ben David? Are you? the son of David. And what Christians will say is that Jesus says, um, he, he actually talks about the fact that sitting at the right hand of the Lord, right? Now, in your Bible, what you'll find in, in, in Matthew when it says that, when he's asked, are you the son of David? And it's quite ambiguous, but the Christians will say, no, he's kind of like saying he is kind of thing. He is, he is actually the Messiah, as it were. Is that there's a lower case Lord and a lower case Lord. So if you go to Psalm, forgive me, because it's in the footnotes, right? If you look at Matthew, I think it's Psalm 110. This is a psalm of David talking about the Messiah. And it, it says that it uses the Lord, Lord being King, Messiah, right? So when it's, obviously when it's Jehovah, it's, it's all capitals, right? And when it's L, capital L and Lord, that's Jesus according to the Christians. So it's capitalized in that psalm. So it's like the Lord, Jehovah, and then it's Jesus, and then you've got David, all in that psalm. And it speaks of how this person, this Ben David, is exactly as the Jews say. So, and there's just a lot of allusions to things that I'll talk about in the third video without getting into too much detail here. I wanted to talk about women and specifically the fall and why it's so important that we have the rainbow now and we have so much LGBTQ um, sexualities happening at this time so you know I'm a straight man I'm a Christian um, I've been married I've had a wife I got divorced um, I want to get married again and have children but obviously in the West there are countless amounts of people who are have a different sexuality to me and within Gen Z, there is a very, very high percentage of people that are now what they would call in that category. Now, this is all explained by Jonathan Kahn in that partly in that from the very beginning, like the rainbow flag is about Venus. Venus being also a god of the rainbow and she had um she being a goddess of love to most people in the west we, we just think of her as a you know a myth a, a, a goddess of love you know a very very beautiful thing but in reality if you read about her she was a warrior queen um she had real transgender um servants and man servants 
and, and people that were transgender. There were, there were real operations that happened in ancient times to have that done. And uh, um, she, she was there uh, in the image of Baphomet, which is a combination, according to um, scholars, excuse me, of Pan with the, with the goat's horns and, and Venus, because they actually had a union. They were, you know, scholars say consorts, they were basically lovers. So Pan was a lover of Venus, even though Venus had many different lovers. And they had a union together. Um, and Pan, obviously, is where we get the word pansexual. So Pan, like a lot of the gods, wasn't, you know, straight. They, they were all fluid, near enough all of them, the fallen ones. And they, they were incestuous and, and, and all sorts of manner of things, which is why the Romans and the Greeks had such a pagan way of seeing things in terms of sex. So her job, according to Jonathan Kahn, was actually to corrupt the marriage between a man and a woman. Now, with me being more liberal, uh, coming from England, seeing all these changes, Jonathan Kahn's an American, I can see that God has allowed the pagan world again to come into being which is what the Bible says, is that the days of Lot and Sodom and Gomorrah are allowed to return. And these old gods are allowed to return. And one of the reasons being is tribulation, is that we are sinners, all of us, and that many of us have, don't believe in Jesus. And that without being persecuted, unfortunately, we're never going to learn. And that's why God allows these devils, basically, to come back. There's also another way of seeing it, which is that we're allowed to choose. We're allowed to choose. You can be um, straight, or you can be gay. And there are many people in the media who are gay that are Christian. I have friends who are gay that are Christian. There are lots of them, you know, when I say them, people. And there are obviously people of all sexual pers persuasions are Christian or, you know, and it's, it's rare to be a Muslim, but, but Christian. So this, this is something that the new generation and people younger than me, I'm 45, will be aware of. Um, they're allowed to choose, you know, as long as you're over 60 in the UK, you're completely free to choose all these sorts of things. It's completely normal. Um, and it's only the Abrahamic fakes that stand in their way kind of thing. But Pan being, according to me, and not just me, you know, this is myriad Hollywood films and songs. And I know that's the West, and, and many people would say, you know, well, you know, it's just a, a continuation of paganism and Christianity mixed together, right? But there are just so many films that speak of Pan. You, you wouldn't believe it. You just wouldn't believe it. I would say, and not just me, but he, he is the epitome of Western modern culture. To the point where, you know, you just got random films like La La Land where Ryan Gosling says I am the everyman and you've got I think it's Emma Stone the lady who is just images of the sun everywhere you know um and you've got um just just myriad films that that have that sort of theme a, a moon a sun and it's just about Adam and Eve basically and and Bathsheba, and she, yeah, she has red hair, 
in the film and there are just so many it's not by accident that you'll see a fair skin lady with red hair that's in a film that has the sun you know um and the, the, the amount of music videos that do it as well but the thing is like it isn't just the west you'll see this in asia as well uh, Korean films, Japanese films, you, you see it around the world. Uh, Australia being part of the West, you know, we, we've got it. And so, Gerald Flory makes clear the significance of women and how important they are having equal status with men. Obviously, we believe this now. But it goes further than that in the Bible to say that obviously women were actually created higher than men in some way. And that that was the whole point of the fall in some way, because she had to be restrained in some way. Well, no, it specifically says that she was restrained and, uh, and basically um, limited for the protection of Adam. Um, the amount of films like The Princess Diaries and others where you have, you know, the classic Apollo taking away the new Eve, um, whatever her name is now. I, I do have theories about who this woman is, believe it or not. So this lady and um, as you can see, Anne Hathaway, and she, she plays... She plays Eve in a lot of films, and there are a myriad actresses who do this throughout their careers, and even, and or they reprise a role that's similar. She, um, you know, and then she she even falls in love with a man who's a boy, who's, who's a schoolboy basically, but he, you know, he's a man who who's called Michael, and and you have the classic. Jewish story of a geeky boy who can't really get the girl um, and it's just a classic story you know of like Clark Kent and Superman being Loki you know Hermes and even within I think it's like the first film of Superman you'll have um Lois Lane, and she speaks about how you know, are you Peter Pan? You know, um, Peter Pan is is you know it's not it's not some sort of theory. He he is Peter Pan. Is is basically is Pan, and Neverland is a place where the fairies are, which is uh, and fairies were basically fallen angels. Um. They, and he, he couldn't grow up, he wouldn't grow up, you know, this is the story of Loki in, in the mythology, is that he was a trickster god, childish, and that he, and then within many, many songs, like for instance, uh, I, do, I believe Blur's The Narcissist is about Loki, you have him called the Pyro, and the Pyro is a, is a clown. And it speaks about him not falling again. Or I won't fall. God's blue doll, heed the signs. And the greatest, greatest allegory I've ever seen, apart from Harry Potter and Star Wars, The Matrix, is a life on Mars and the sequel, Ashes to Ashes. Oh my word. The, the people who produced this, of which one of them was a Doctor Who producer, right? it's so unbelievably supernatural and spook spooky, it's unreal. You know, you have so many references to the whole, like I say, the whole of Western culture broken down in these episodes by the BBC. And you even have, um, I forgot his name, like, but 
the person who plays uh, the man in, in Life on Mars, and he even plays the master in, in Doctor Who. And you have to watch it, you have to watch it, you know, because it, I wasn't going to do this right, but there's so many uh, music videos that are just seminal, seminal to the story of the Bible and Judaism and Western culture. Um, but I wanted to keep it on topic about women. But it does relate to women in one way. Um, yeah, I'll end the video just by saying that a life on Mars, which is referenced in, obviously, life on Mars and Ashes to Ashes, and the, and the sequel, Ashes to Ashes, that the song by David Bowie, is so strange because you listen to that song you think, oh, you know, David Bowie admits that he, you know, he would just cut up bits of paper and, and make things up kind of thing. And a lot of it was just abstract life. But you listen to that and then you watch Life on Mars and Ashes to Ashes and, and you realise that they are speaking in an incredible way. So he says that um, Mickey Mouse has grown up a cow. Now, and he points this, I mean, as a child, like, now, in Disney, Mickey Mouse is based upon the Sorcerer's Apprentice, which to many scholars is an old Indian poem, which is where you get in Disney's Fantasia the story of a an apprentice who, you know, the story goes, is left on his own and, and he casts a spell and it all goes wrong kind of thing. And you see that there's a there's a film with um, uh, what's his name from um, from leaving Las Vegas. What's his name? Anyway, the the that the famous actor um, leaving Las Vegas, um, married Lisa Marie. He he's it. He's in it. The Source Apprentice, and his name is David in the Source Apprentice, and he's Jewish. And yeah, Mickey Mouse is the Sorcerer's Apprentice. It actually, I think it was voiced by Walt Disney himself originally. Um, so the Sorcerer's Apprentice is very, very important. You, you even see a, a, a T-shirt of the Sorcerer's Apprentice, Mickey Mouse, in Back to the Future on Marty McFly's brother who yeah it's called David and the whole of Back to the Future obviously written by uh, Zemeckis a Jewish man and, and directed partly directed is it um, I think it's with the help of um, I'm not sure if Spielberg has not a part of that but they're definitely written by partly written by Zemeckis a, a Jewish man and there's so many things within Back to the Future which allude to the Bible, it's unreal really. Which which lays into Rick and Morty, which is just a direct reference to Back to the Future. And then, you know, Morty even having a Jewish name. Um, within the, I think it's the first episode, it talks about um, Adam, Rick and Morty and Adam. And then um, McFly, obviously, I think that's a play on words, like with, with him being Hermes. Like, And then, uh, obviously, when I say Hermes and these superheroes, they all have an alter ego. So one will be Ben David, usually the shy, geeky one, like Clark Kent. And then the alter ego will be the Superman. The reason he's called Superman, written by... They're all mostly written by Jewish people, American Jews are mostly. Is the um, and I've got a book, which just lays it out that the history of it being that a lot of them comic books were written during the just before the war, after the war, 
and they wanted a superhero to lift them out of what happened during the Nazi persecution. So they, they created these heroes and then obviously put their religion within it. Stanley being a Jewish man as well, changed his name. Many, as you know, many Jewish people did change their name, especially to avoid persecution. Um, such as, I think, I don't know if Bill Gates did change his name because of persecution, but Bill Gates is a Jewish man and, and um, he does have a different name. Many Jewish people have got different names. So the fact is, is that it, it's right there in the early comic books, Genesis, is that you'll have so many allusions to it, you know, um, Incredible Hulk being a, a golem, which was a uh, superhero that the Jews had, uh, supposedly that they could create a inanimate object, like a wooden carving, and then they could cast a spell, uh, I'm not saying a spell, like a prayer, and then it would come to life. I'm not saying this is real, this, this is just what there are reports of. I think it's during the Middle Ages even. Um, and this is obviously where you get Gollum in The Lord of the Rings. Which fits nicely into the fact that all these heroes have a leading lady, heroic lady, a woman, who is a lot of the time more powerful than him. So in Star Wars, Rey is more powerful than Kylo Ren. It was an obvious take of um, a fallen Adam and a type of Ben David. And then we have it, you know, like I say, within Batman being the superhero justice person, a Ben David, and then Joker being Loki. And these aren't my assertions. These are literal that the writers saying it or, or these actors playing these similar roles, you know, like Janikerson in The Shining playing another type of person, literally called Jack again. And then we have um, just the amount of writers that are Jewish. Uh, I'm not sure if Stephen King is, I think he might be. He wrote The Shining. Um, and obviously with Judaism being... Um, having different parts, hierarchies to their faith with rabbis knowing an incredible amount and that the ordinary people wouldn't know specifically about their own faith. Um, it's inevitable that there are people that go into Hollywood or into science fiction and simply uh, put in the religion and they just don't even disguise it to be honest with you. I mean, George Lucas is a Jewish person and he doesn't disguise it. And some of them are actually secular Jews. Obviously it's a massive community of Jewish people and they're not all related to Israel in, the, in their allegiances and things. And there's just myriad different types of people who are Jewish, right? And some of them are secular Jews, and they, and they they've simply made a made a living out of putting this hero into it, and then incorporating the pagan world. Um. Now, um, J.K. Rowling is a Christian. Uh, says it quite candidly. Um. But. What what's remarkable, you know, so of all the female characters that I can see that are in these films, a lot of them, one of them that you won't be aware of is related to Pan is Echo. Echo was a nymph and the nymph was a It's not nice to say that, but there were hierarchies of angels, as you know, and the nymph was a lower angel, as it were, 
of uh, forests and that this is where Pan would famously chase these nymphs throughout Arcadia and they would you know it's where we get the word nymphomaniac and, and, and they would be naked a lot of the time kind of thing and Pan Pan would try to have sex with these nymphs and a lot of the nymphs would push him away to the point where one of them was so offended by him that uh, she you know the father like helped to change into a tree and then he, he got upset and then he created the pan pirates from like reeds that, that he found um, and this is why he he became a musician and it helped him to for one of that word get women now it sounds incredible to say but it, it's all there in the stories like and then he yeah ironically got the most beautiful woman of of those supposed times venus um and and he and he also had a echo as a lover and disney plus has got echo again as a superhero and even though they were lovers in ancient times uh, and they had a child i am which is where we get i am pentameter from in star wars i'm going to talk about this too much right but there there are many many allusions to women obviously uh, princess leia and ray um which is not kylo ren's lover they do love each other excuse me but they're not meant to be lovers you know they never actually have sex in the film and they do kiss at the end but they they basically sacrifice themselves for each other to fight the dark side um but there are so many references to pan within poetry music and songs so you even have echo and the bunny man you have um, echo and the bunny man features highly within donnie darko which and the song that's that's most famous echo by the man one of them the killing moon uh, reference obviously to the moon there and then and, and adam ben david and david basically talks about himself as well we have it in the bible as the moon so you know it's not coming from me that there are scriptures where he he's referenced as the moon and um, the moon and the sun uh, and an Eva, I believe these things are talked about in the Talmud. There are Jewish encyclopedias that I have that they speak of the inner context. Um, there's so many volumes to the Talmud, but a lot of these things are explained. You know, there's there's the whole backstory behind Joseph in the Talmud, and there's even a book. Um, about all the 12 brothers and they all are dying and they all have regrets about what happened um, and, and they, they say exactly what you shouldn't do and why you shouldn't do what I've done kind of thing as a brother um, never heard anyone modern christians speak about eve and 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 her significance in the end times kind of thing um but it's very very clear that she is important and that she was according to jews bathsheba is here again um 
I'll finish with a timeline with why I talk about this theory of everything, why it's so important to know. Many people are converting to the Abrahamic faith because they realize that there is this mass awakening in the world and obviously persecution of the Jews all over the West and the world and things and the rise of Islam and a, a decline in spirituality for other people and paganism. But the thing is, is that, excuse me, um, Clarence Larkin specifically states, and it's obvious, that there is a time of the Gentiles. As we know, you know, this is the whole reason why Christians believe in Jesus, because it was the Gentiles who accepted Jesus the most, apart from the inner circle of Jews, like the apostles, who um, took up took it upon themselves to make it the bedrock of their society of which America and Great Britain were one of the highest obviously the Rome and then the the timeline that I have that seems to be very very true and specific is that Jesus died in 31 AD and that there was, he said he would come back in 2000 years. And that obviously takes us up to 2031. With there being a seven year tribulation, that means that unbelievably that the tribulation could happen. And obviously People throughout history have got this wrong, and that's why many secular people, and even Christians, don't even bother to talk about the apocalypse. I have friends who say, you know, you, you shouldn't really talk about it, or wish it into being, kind of thing. That the Antichrist will be here by 2025. Now, I don't want to talk too much about him and what's going on, other than, obviously, you can read it within... Um, revelation that he is Apollo, Apollyon, rider on a white horse, I'll get banned if I talk too much about what's happening in that sort of thing and I just want to talk about it in terms of the goodness as Jonathan Kahn says because the truth is all that matters and like I say whether you're on the left or you're on the right if you do believe in Christ and you do repent and you do try to follow the law to the best of your ability. Um, the Bible says that Jesus says that you are saved. Right. Um, it, it, it doesn't necessarily mean that I have a decision in that. You know, it's Jesus who, who decides, obviously, God, whether or not you've fulfilled that requirement kind of thing like there's different schools of thought whether or not you just say i'm believe in jesus will you forgive me kind of thing and then there are other people that say especially catholics and others who say you have to do good works and to prove as it were even in with the letters the epistle of james i think it's the epistle isn't it yeah where well, you know, he, he just goes straight into like things that most people wouldn't understand all the kind of like good works that one, one has to basically prove that you love somebody. Actions speak louder than words, that's all it is, kind of thing. It's not enough to say, I love you, I love her. You know, you have to treat her with kindness and love and dignity, and you have to be become like a try to be a better person. When you have Christ in your life, otherwise you don't really have him in your life, kind of thing. But, like I say, we are all worthy of respect. And we are all definitely divine sparks. And we do have to hate the sin of the sinner. And this, this obviously most people in Gen Z, especially, are just turned off and 
you know, you're watching YouTube because you don't want to watch TV and the news and the news has just fallen away. And there are very few people that watch the news anymore because obviously it's been taken over by a specific group of people, mainly men, rich men, very few rich men, unfortunately, who have just decided to have a political agenda. So the debate is on YouTube, it is on Rumble, it is online, it is in the Nag Hammadi library. There is so much evidence out there that that whether you're on the right or the left, Jesus said you would be sheep on the right or go on the left. This is so specific because he said that that Israel would be the center ground or the talking point in the last days. So there is a seven year tribulation. The first three and a half years are actually, I think, peaceful. Um, Just before then, unfortunately, there is a major war that breaks out. Now, the the good news, like I say, is that none of us have to actually be fighting. And Ben David is actually here, if he does come, which I believe he will be, and he is here, is to bring in peace. Being the Messiah of all seven major religions, his job, is to bring in peace to all the Abrahamic religions, believe it or not. And there will be a schism within Islam. And some will follow him and some will not, according to even the Hadith and the scriptures. So, and then there will be you know, without getting into too much detail because it's too controversial, there there is a lot of war that can be avoided if people were to look at these videos, do their own research, don't laugh. You know, I don't I don't actually know if anyone's laughing or or just thinking what's going off like. But if, if, if you look at Jonathan Kahn's YouTube and you, you read his books, you'll see that I'm not saying anything too outward from what he's saying, even though he doesn't believe in Ben David. Um, I'm sure he'll come to this realisation at some point. It's inevitable. Um, with him writing about these gods, you, you can't. You can't write a book called The Return of the Gods and miss out Hermes. It's ridiculous. With him being specifically a god of the rainbow. Uh, And even in Flash Gordon's new film, you know, you have his, like, his girlfriend, basically, is Iris. You know, Iris is the, another goddess of the rainbow. Um, Like I said, these writers don't even hide it. It, it, it's, It's within just about every single Hollywood film that's coming out. And they've all got women in them. They've all got incredible, heroic women in them. And it's very much women in the last days that I believe bring in revival. Because women are able to see the truth sometimes more than men. Men can be swayed by political agendas and bias. Women can obviously too. But because women are natural psychologists, and I've done a master's degree in psychology, and because they can see through the lies of men a lot easier than men can see lies, and because they are, many of them, mothers, they know the other side of things, you know, they've got children, boys and girls, and they can see both sides of life a lot easier than, say, a man could. 
I'm not saying they don't, but that's just my opinion, and I'm not a father. Now, there are many women in the West, especially in the UK, who are turning towards the left, especially where I'm in Nottingham, and they're doing it mainly because they believe in equality and love and freedom and uh, they want to choose their sexual orientation and women have a natural proclivity to look after children and they want to help society and they want to build a better future and they want to look after the environment and they are lots of women on the right as well obviously but the younger generation especially the people i've met are on the left they would say like they're identifying as that i'm not saying that they are they, they identify as that and what i would say is um don't let israel put you off the fact that they have said things jews that, that aren't necessarily in their own scriptures and things because this is not just them doing that. This is Muslims doing this. This is Christians doing this. You know, a lot of people, women are turned off by religion completely. But this is secular people doing this. Hypocrisy, double standards, leaders, corruption. One can't just point the finger at Israel, the nation. And say, you know, you've not lived up to these expectations as a lot of people have. Even though some of it's true. Because the Bible is very specific. Um, that we're all going to go through tribulation. Apart from those who are raptured. And we don't know when the rapture is. And some people don't even believe the rapture is going to happen. So... You know, in the West, especially in, in the UK, we're taught at university not to definitely judge um, from what we've just read in the previous path. Excuse me, and that is that is why um, it's unfortunate to see universities be hijacked by political agendas, whether it be on the right or the left. Because I was always taught that if you don't look at all the different sorts of opinions and you don't let money corrupt you or um, the zeitgeist of that day, which are specifically funded by a lot of men, basically, like, you know, straight out of the bat it's money doing this, um, you know, political parties and, and people and agendas and stuff and governments being bought out basically and um, and people selling out. If you really are free thinking and liberal and you really do want to understand what's happening, you need to definitely, definitely, definitely Take these videos seriously. Um, I do have a master's degree in psychology. I have studied the Bible since I was basically 16 and I am 45. So, and I've watched thousands and thousands of movies. I've read about the Roman pantheon of history. I've read about the Greeks. I've read about Hinduism, all the seven major religions. I haven't extensively researched um, the Baha faith and um, some of the others, um, but rest assured they are all saying that they have a Messiah and that this person is who I say it is. Um, So in The Hollow, on Netflix, 
there's a cartoon and um, the person that's the protagonist is called Adam a specific you know Ben David's often called Adam in these films or cartoons it is his name in in, in Jewish scholars books they will call him Adam sometimes even called Israel sometimes as well which is, is what a lot of I think Robbie Togger Singer says that um, you know this suffering servant is Israel because we see that in one of the verses in Isaiah it says Israel but Israel is another name for Ben David as well and he's called a ensign within this ayah. I think it's Isaiah 59. Where it's, and then he, which Benson commentary and other commentaries say is a standard or a flag. So Ben David is actually just at the beginning and, and within his life, even though he, he does do miraculous things. He's kind of, with him being hidden until it revealed, until he's revealed kind of thing. And I don't even know if he's fully, ever fully revealed until the Daniel Kingdom. Um, ben Joseph is the main person that does all the political will of God. Um, who, I, who I have said in the description, the first one is, to my understanding, ex-president Trump. And him being symbolic of the baker in the Joseph story and Ben David being the cupbearer. So Ben Javis being bread, sinful, unbelievably so, as people have noted, um, part of man, Christ. Even though Christ was perfect, he, he took on our sins and part of the flesh was, was sinful, but the blood, pure, no sin, but still both of them are sacrifices, the, the bread and the flesh and the, and the blood. Um, I don't want to talk too much <clears throat> about that, like I say. It's, um, it's an ongoing political upheaval in America right now. And obviously I could be wrong. So I don't want to paint judgments upon people by naming them like that in case it's wrong. And there are consequences to that. But all we can do is use our scholarly research and our faith guide us um, and I'll leave this for the time being and I'll talk more in the third video like I say with some more do a whole video of specific verses from the Bible so people with voiceover so it's not so um, heavily my opinion <laughs>